ECG of someone who has ischemic heart disease or especially in the setting of suspected acute coronary syndrome. I think I'd like to take you back to the basics of coronary anatomy and a little bit of understanding of how the coronary anatomy works really helps. So you have only three coronary arteries. Your left main stem or the left coronary artery actually bifurcates into the left anterior descending artery and the left circumflex. Now, we all know about the left anterior descending and it supplies a large territory, typically the anterior walls, the septal walls, and sometimes part of the lateral walls as well. The circumflex will then wrap around this part, what we call the lateral wall of the heart, to supply you know, the, blood with, uh, the uh, myocardium with blood. And in some cases where the circumflex is large, you actually get a dominant circumflex that extends even to the uh, inferior territory of the heart. On your right, you have the right coronary artery. It typically supplies the right ventricle, gives blood you know, the, via the marginal branches, the right ventricular branches. And in the case of what we call a dominant right coronary artery, it supplies the posterior descending artery and terminates at the uh, AV groove. Now, this is my personal sort of approach to uh, someone who has an acute coronary syndrome ECG. My first step is that I actually make sure that the patient's name and ECG is correct. I've personally misinterpreted ECGs, a stack of ECGs, when one of the ECGs actually didn't belong to the same patient. My second step is that I look at the rhythm strip, and uh, Paul and Prof Ching give excellent uh, lectures on how you interpret the heart rhythm. Now, third, I tend to territorize the precordial and the limb leads based on the vascular territory to kind of really give you or to crystallize your approach uh, to ST elevation. Now, this is a normal ECG, but what I do first is that I look at the anterior leads. Now, the anterior leads here are marked out in this yellow box here. Okay, the anterior leads are generally not easily missed because they're always at the center of your screen. The next is usually can, can be often missed, and that's why I always urge you after looking at anterior leads to take a very careful look at the lead 2, lead 3, and AVF. These are leads that supply the inferior walls and sometimes very small and subtle ST elevation in inferior walls can actually be missed. The last territory is the one that I find that, uh, can commonly be missed and that's why I've put it in red. Uh, these leads uh, occur at the different places on the ECG. You see lead 1 over here, you see lead AVL here, and V5 and V6 all the way over the other side. But these constitute as the part of the leads that are looking towards the left side, the left lateral border of the heart. And these are what we call the lateral territory, usually supplied by a circumflex, a large diagonal, or in some cases, a very large PAV uh, groove. So I'm going to move to the first part of the uh, session and flash this quick ECG and ask you to pull for response. Now, this patient's diagnosis is already there, and the patient has an acute MI. Now, what is the a territory of infarct or the infarct artery. Now, there's a quite a good variety of answers. I'll walk you through the actual ECG and then we can see what the answer is. Now, personally, I think that the answer is probably going to be the right proximal right coronary artery and I'll share with you why. Now, in the rhythm leads, you can see no P waves, irregular, irregular RR interval, and that's atrial fibrillation. We have very gross ST elevation in the inferior lead in this case and a diagnosis of acute, an acute MI on the ECG itself. So this is an inferior MI. Now I'm going to draw your attention to V2 and V3. Now, if you look at it very carefully, you see a very unique pattern where you have ST depression in V2 to V3 that is then contiguous with what we have, this tall sort of T wave, upright looking T wave. And I'm going to ask you to remember this pattern because this is a typical sort of appearance of what we call posterior MI. Now, if you imagine the posterior leads being done as such where we take these leads and we're going to flip them upside down. Now, you can see the ST elevations very grossly. And this V2, V3 looking from the front, when you flip them uh, around, actually look at the heart from the back. And this posterior territory is what we uh, uh, actually has ST elevations consistent with a posterior ST elevation, MI. Now, moving to lead one you'll see very uniquely that in this case, the lead one is isoelectric, or if you can imagine, there's every, even a bit of slight bit of ST elevation of V1. This is actually suggestive, even without the presence or a need for right-sided ECG, that this patient likely has a right ventricular ST elevation MI. 
we all know that this patient needs to receive urgent reperfusion therapy early. And if you want to guess where this coronary artery uh, occlusion occurs, you can look at lead two and lead three. In lead three, the ST elevation is higher than lead two. I like to think of lead three as looking closer to the right side as compared to lead two. And hence, I think based on all these features, the likely uh, coronary occlusion is in the proximal RCA. And this is a right-sided ECG just to confirm that this patient has an RV infarct as well. So a little bit about the pathophysiology of ST elevation myocardial infarction. We know all very well about plaque rupture in the setting of a thrombotic, uh, in the setting of a thin cap fibroartroma, where uh, this uh, fissures in the plaque actually result in you know release of all this yucky material, and when the uh, what they call fibrotic uh, or uh, lipid-rich material hits the bloodstream, it actually forms a clot that blocks off the blood circulation to the coronary arteries. And when that happens, it actually causes an area of what we call a transmural infarct. The entire myocardium cannot get blood. And this is actually very clearly manifested as ST elevation on the ECG pattern. Now, a couple of tips and tricks on how to interpret the ST segment. This is what we term as the J-point. After the QRS segment, it terminates as the J-point, and this is actually where we measure the ST segment, whether there is elevation or not. Now, bring your attention to all these terms that you will see in the textbook, such as uh, how to diagnose a ST elevation MI, but I will actually caution you that some of these ECG research terms are actually more of research criteria. Personally, I think the symptoms of AMI and the suggestive ECG are the most important criteria. The height of the ST segment to me is perhaps less useful per se. What I think is more helpful that has really you know, helped me more than uh, multiple times is actually looking at the morphology of the ST segment. Now, if you see sandwiching the center, you know these two pictures, the straight pattern of the ST segment here, as well as what we call the convex pattern. So I like to think of this as a sad face. These two are very strongly suggestive of a STMI. On the other hand, you have a concave pattern. Here, someone has very helpfully put a smiley face. So a smiling patient, a smiley ECG, tends to be a more benign sort of early repolarization ECG, much less suggestive of a ST elevation MI. So now we're familiar with all these. We're going to practice this in the next uh, question. This patient, you're shown this ECG, you have no clinical background. So what is your appropriate response? Most of people got it correct. So this patient requires an emergent primary PCI. You've picked up very well that the lateral leads have very distinct ST elevation. And these are, as we said before, these are the horizontal of, in fact, if anything, a bit convex sort of uh, pattern. There's reciprocal changes. And those of you who are very observant may even pick up that there's poor RV progression, suggesting that the myocardium has previously already had low ejection fraction. So the appropriate therapy in this case will be primary reperfusion therapy. But the remaining people also did something really good. And they thought about all the differential diagnosis of uh, what could be the cause of ST elevation. So in a patient who doesn't come to you with typical chest pain, you have to think long and hard about what are other causes of ST elevation. And here we have a couple of great examples. The examples for uh, four and five are very typical ST elevation of a thrombotic occlusion, thrombotic coronary occlusion. But the first example here is someone with very deep S waves in V2 and usually corresponding very tall R waves in V5 and V6. This is left ventricular hypertrophy. I saw upsloping ST segment, and this is generally not due to an acute MI. The second ECG here is that of a left bundle branch block. I have an ECG on the left bundle branch block later, so we'll go through that. So the third ECG here is someone with a very bizarre sine wave looking pattern, QRS followed by S elevated ST segment, followed by a very broad sort of a T wave, tall T wave, and this is someone who actually has hyperkalemia, an end-stage renal failure patient. And last but not least, this is a really nice ECG pattern of someone who has Bugada type of ECG. It's described as this cove-shaped ST elevation that we typically see in lead V1. And in the setting of syncope and so forth, Bugada syndrome is probably your diagnosis when you see this ECG. So I'm going to move to part two.
And part two really covers the high-risk ECG patterns, high-risk ACS, STEMI equivalents or ECG pattern. I have two examples. The first is what we call a left main ECG pattern. And here you can see a very classical sort of appearance where we have eight or more leads. In this case, the limb leads as well, the precordial leads have very diffuse or ST depression of one millimeter or more. And this is accompanied on the AVR, which is actually looking at the heart from the opposite side. And you see reciprocal sort of ST elevation. This is a high-risk ECG pattern, and this means that this patient needs sort of urgent uh, cardiac uh, uh, attention. Next, we have what we call hyperacute T waves. Now, if you look at this ECG in a setting of patient with ongoing typical chest pain, very tall T waves, you can remember that this is what we describe as a hyperacute T wave pattern, and it is considered a STEMI equivalent. What I find interesting about this particular ECG pattern is that they are also these diffuse T wave, uh, ST depression that connect to these really tall T waves. And someone has given the name called the D Winters ECG pattern. It's thought to be like an anterior STEMI sort of equivalent that occurs in the anterior precordial leads. So essentially, my take home for these patterns is that they are considered as a STEMI equivalent and they should equally receive uh, urgent primary reperfusion therapy. Now let's change gears a little bit. So now in question three, this patient has come to you. He's uh, seen as a consult for mild shortness of breath in a &E, but he's otherwise well with no chest pain. So will we need more information after we see this ECG? Or do we think that this patient needs a CRTD, a 24-hour ECG monitor, or should we bring this patient to the cath lab? Also, once again, a very good uh, distribution of answers. Now, this is my personal opinion, but I, I feel that I would probably need a bit more information for this patient. Now, I'll give you my reasons why. Um, on the rhythm strip, we see one, that there's a prolonged PR segment suggestive of a first degree AV block. This is what we call a typical left bundle branch block pattern. And I say so because in V2, there's a very deep S wave accompanied by a tall R wave in V6 with no Q wave seen. The QRS interval is 120 milliseconds. So most of us will recognize this as a left bundle branch block. Now the problem with the left bundle branch block, as you can see quite often, is that the ST segments are elevated in V2, V3 and depressed in V5, V6. And I'm going to tell you that these segments, ST elevation, ST depression are actually appropriate. The reason behind this is that for the left bundle branch block, the direction of the ST segment will always typically go opposite to the QRS complex. So if you have a QRS that points downwards, you expect the ST segment naturally to go upwards. So this in alone, this ECG finding in alone doesn't tell me that the patient has a STEM. So left bundle branch block ECGs are quite tricky because they can mean a number of things, patient could have coronary artery disease, but patient could also have some myocardial disease, conduction system disease. So this, the next slide kind of highlights the conjunctions with left bundle branch block. I'll summarize my thoughts as a new left bundle branch block with the acute coronary syndrome presentation is considered a STEMI equivalent, but a new left bundle branch block in the absence of an ACS presentation is not the activation criteria. Now, the reason behind this is that the left bundle branch block traditionally was thought of an activation criteria because it masks the ST changes that usually come with a STEMI. So typically, if you have an underlying left bundle branch block, you have a typical ACS pattern, you can sometimes not be able to interpret the ST segment. But however, this is not particularly sensitive and specific, or specific. So people have come up with ways to kind of help you uh, get more accuracy when you have a left bundle branch block in a patient with acute coronary syndrome. And a lot of it basically depends on what I've already mentioned just now, your understanding of how the ST segment behaves in relation to the QRS. So I'll draw your attention to A, picture A here. You know based on the previous diagram that the V5, V6 ST segments are supposed to go in the opposite direction of your QRS complexes. So in the Scabosa's criteria, it basically tells you that if the ST segment go up instead of down, 
this is very strongly suggestive of a ST elevation MI. On the other hand, in V2 and V3, if you see ST depression instead of ST elevation, you should also strongly suspect there is some ongoing myocardial ischemia. Last but not least, the least specific criteria is actually this third criteria of Scabosa, where if you have a very tall ST segment, what we call discordantly tall ST segment in the V2 and V3, then that may be suggestive of a STMI. And some people have refined it further to actually say that if you have a ST segment elevation of 30% or more in relation to the deep S wave, this is a bit more uh, specific. Now, I actually have only one last slide, and this is a patient who comes into clinic to see you. He's uh, walked into a polyclinic. He's done an ECG at the private uh, screening, health screening, and he's asked you for advice. So we want to pull the audience to see what would you do. Would you uh, give him aspirin? Would you take him to the cath lab? Do you need more information? Or will we get him an urgent echocardiogram? So this is my interpretation of the ECG. Now, this guy has sinus rhythm, in fact, sinus bradycardia. He has deep Q waves with a slight ST segment elevation and T wave inversion. This is consistent with someone who has an old anterior MI. The R waves are slightly impaired. And this is someone that if you have no symptoms, you will actually give aspirin. You will advise him on chest pain precaution and you get him to see the cardiologist at the next available appointment for further cardiac assessment. So in summary, I've covered a bit of a basics of coronary anatomy. We've talked about ECG in acute coronary syndrome and moved to ECG in stable ischemic heart disease. So thank you so much for all the attention. Mm -hmm.